Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you in church this morning. We're going to begin by standing together and singing this wonderful song, singing about heaven today. It's found in Psalm 56 in your songbooks, or you can look to the screens. When we all get to heaven, we will shout the victory. Song 56. It's good for me. Let's sing together Song 56. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Jesus will sing and shout the victory on the second. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overtread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory we're getting warmed up this morning here's what I want us to do we're not gonna turn around and shake hands but I want you to turn around and wave to one another this morning if you haven't told them yet tell them I'm glad to see you in church today say hello in just a minute we're gonna come back and sing that fourth stanza together sing that chorus yeah we're gonna sing that fourth chorus together when we all get to heaven song number 56 we've got the chorus up there i think it's up there on the screens we're gonna we're getting our piano ready here in just a minute when we all get to heaven we aren't gonna have to worry about the piano going out in the middle of the service that's gonna be wonderful we'll sing it all together there we go it's got it there we've got that chorus let's sing it one more time when we all get to heaven when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory Amen. Thank you for singing this morning. You may be seated. It sure is good. It sure is good to have all of you here with us today. I'm going to ask our special music if they would come and prepare to sing it this time. And uh, even though we've had a little bit of a technical difficulty, a little bit of a glitch to start out with this morning, uh, uh, you, you just roll right with it. You sang and you welcome, greeted one another, and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful day here in God's house. But at this time, uh, Miss Alexa is going to sing for us, and so you pray for her as she does. you know I don't have much to offer, but you'll use all that I give. I pray you'll make me more like thee, serving you each day I live. Father, hear this simple plea, purge all my faults, take all my pride. I surrender, Lord, be glorified, hear my earnest cry. Take my life, Lord, let it be consecrated all for Thee. Take my life, Lord, let it be burning fuel for Thee. Take my life, O oh Lord, I give it up now. Take my works to be refined. Please take my thoughts and actions, Lord. Lead in your perfect design. As I yield to you each day, help me to never go astray. I surrender. 
appreciate the truth of that song. I'm so thankful that when God looks at us, he does not ask us for, uh, not uh, give us opportunities or, or is looking for us to, uh, in the sense of he doesn't want our, uh, uh, doesn't look a judge based on talents or things of that nature. What I'm trying to say this morning is God wants us just to be available. You may look at your life and you say, I, I don't know what I have to offer. I may not be able to sing like that. I may not be able to give this. I may not be able to, to serve in these areas. Rather than looking at that, all God wants you to look at your life and, and say, all right, Lord, here is my life. Whichever way that you want to use me, God, take me and use it. I belong to you. And that's your prayer this morning, then God certainly will use you. And you'll be amazed because it will be him working through you and only he can get the glory for it. Thank you so much for that song, Alexa. Let's all stand together. We're going to continue singing this morning. Song number 55. Song 55, when the roll is called up yonder, you can look in your songbooks or look to the screens. Song 55. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 i'll be there bright and cloudless morning on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in christ shall rise the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 i'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care when all our life is over and our work on earth is done, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. We have much to look forward to, and so if your faith is in Jesus Christ this morning as your personal Savior, you can say with assurance, what a day that is going to be when my Jesus I shall see. One song, final song this morning, song 63, what a day that will be, song 63. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more gladness in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be now church listen to the second the second verse about what we're singing i know we've had a little bit of distraction this morning with some piano and some things not working but i want you to focus on the words that we're gonna sing what a day that's going to be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And as great as that is, the best part is still yet to come. Forever I will be with the one who died for me. If you're looking forward to seeing Jesus face to face, would you say amen this morning? Amen. Let's lift our voices and sing that second stanza together. There'll be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness
sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sing it out, church. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated real quickly. I want to say again another welcome. I know we've had a number of folks who have come in since our service has started. The first couple of songs there. I want to say thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for joining us and watching via live stream. I do want to just share a little bit of sad news with it. Well, it's sad for us, but uh, not so sad for the, the, the individual because of the truths that we've been singing about today. Uh, one of our dear, dear, one of our oldest church members is actually today getting to experience the things that we just sang about. Uh, this past Friday night, I think we have a, a picture up on the screen here. This past Friday night, uh, Brother Don Kemp went home to be with the Lord. And uh, I put a picture up here on the screen because Brother Don has not been able to attend our service in person really for about a year now through some different health issues and different needs there. He was 95 years old. And uh, his wife there next to him, Ms. D, 94 years old, just married a little, just celebrated their 73rd wedding anniversary not too long ago. And uh, mentioned a little bit about it on Wednesday night in our prayer time and Bible study that Brother Don was uh, looking like he was really close to going home to be with the Lord and got a chance to go over there a couple of different times this week, spent some time with them in the family. Uh, but I know as things just seem to progress rather quickly. We had been praying that uh, for health reasons that he'd get a chance to spend some time and uh, move in with his daughter there, have a house to uh, all there live together so they could uh, take, uh, continue taking care of him uh, way out in Sun City West. And they just moved there this past week. And uh, really just about uh, a matter of about a week has helped progress to the state where it looked like called in hospice on, on the, earlier in the week and looked like he was close to being with the Lord. But I sure do am, love Brother Don. I'm sure am going to miss Brother Don. And uh, he loved this church. Uh, I said on Wednesday night, I'll say it again, about eight years, for eight years, he was praying that God would send somebody to this area and start a Bible preaching church close to him. And right before they moved last week, he just lived in an apartment complex not too far from the CVS down here. And uh, so think about how God was working. Man, that was while I was in college, before I met Alexa, before we did an internship, before God ever directed us towards this north part of Phoenix, there was somebody that was praying that God would you send a preacher, would you send a church to our area. And I truly believe our church is here today because of prayers uh, for individuals like Brother Don. And sure am grateful for him. Uh, and I know he's, it's been a while since he's physically been able to be in our service and uh, was one of the few individuals that uh, at 95 years old just did not have any kind of internet access and uh, so was not able to watch or uh, participate in our live streaming, but that did not stop Brother Don from being involved in our church. I mean, every single week. Uh, if not once, multiple times a week, I would get a call from Brother Don just asking what is going on in the church and what you preach on and how's your family. And uh, so even though he was not able to be here in person, he stayed up to date with everything. He loved our church. And most importantly, he loved our Savior. And uh, look, and he is and today uh, is the best worship service of his life. I can guarantee you that he's getting to sing and getting to see his Savior face to face. I know some folks have asked about funeral arrangements and things there. And talking with a family this past week, they are going, they're wanting to uh, wait a couple of weeks and then have a, a celebration of life service for him. And so when we get some more details along those lines, we'll pass along that information. Of course, not exactly sure right now of uh, what all that's going to look like as far as uh, – uh, what number can attend and where that's going to be. But uh, when we get some word of that, we will let you know, and our church will look to help in any way that we can. But sure am grateful for Brother Don. Sure am grateful for the truths of scriptures, that while we do sorrow and while we do miss him, we do not have to sorrow as those without hope. Because of Jesus, we know we will see him again one day, and that will be a wonderful day. What a day that's going to be. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank the Lord for what he's already done and, and uh, helped us in our midst, and ask him to continue helping us today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we've been reminded through the songs this morning of just how wonderful heaven is. 
and why we have a reason to rejoice. We can look around us, Lord. We can look at current events. We can look at uh, uh, economy. We can look at finances. There's so much around us in this sin-cursed world that can leave us discouraged or leave us depressed. But, Lord, you don't desire us, and you don't leave us to live our lives in that manner. Rather, you call us and, and tell us to be a joyful people, to pe live as if we have hope, and it's because we do have hope. Not because of us, not because of our works of righteousness, but all because of Jesus, what he accomplished for us on the cross and in rising again from the grave. I thank you for the promise of heaven. And we would also do pray for our church family. We pray for the camps right now, Ms. D especially, that you would comfort them and give them grace uh, as only that you can over these next few days and these next few weeks. Lord, I thank you for uh, the time that we had with Brother Don, the blessing and the encouragement that he was to us, and the example and the legacy that he leaves behind. May we be challenged and may we continue to be encouraged by his life. Lord, we ask the remainder of our service as we prepare to open up your word here in just a moment that you would bless the preaching and the teaching of your word. Lord, the, the truths that we're going to look at today, they are very, very important, but we also understand they are somewhat of a sensitive truth, one that we need grace to receive and humility to receive, and we certainly need your grace to apply it as well. So God, would you help us and bless the remainder of this service? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are going to move right into our message and sermon together this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Numbers and chapter number 12. There is a book in the Bible called Numbers. And it gives a, lot, a listing of the numbers, a lot of the, the generations and the, uh, the census of Israel there. But Numbers chapter 12. If you're visiting with us this morning and you need a Bible, there are some Bibles on the blue welcome table over there. Please, yes, already go ahead, help yourself. And uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we'd like you to take that Bible with you. And uh, consider that a free gift from our church. We'd like you to have a copy of God's Word, be able to read and follow along with us this morning, uh, but also to read on your own and to study the Bible for yourself. And so thank you for being with us today. We are going through a series on Sunday mornings uh, as it relates to our theme for the year, which is unmovable. From 1 Corinthians 15, 58, we desire to be a church that is steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, serving God no matter what. Or We don't want a faith that is hindered and uh, turns aside by the different obstacles that we face in life. And so we have seen in the past couple of Sunday mornings that our faith will experience and come across different obstacles. Uh, we need to be unmoved by fear and unmoved by doubt and unmoved by trials and different uh, troubles and situations that we may face, difficulties. And aren't you glad that the Bible speaks towards all of those situations and more? The Bible always is relevant and gives us principles that can help us where we are in our lives at this very moment. But the one we're looking at this morning, the obstacle that we're looking at, I'll be honest with you, right before we even get into the message, this is probably the most difficult. We all, we, we need God's grace and God's help for every single one that we've looked at thus far, but that is certainly the case with the obstacle we're looking at this morning, and that is criticism, or, or a critical spirit. So you found your place there in Numbers chapter 12. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able, if you wouldn't mind standing with me one more time today. As we show respect to the word of God, we're going to look at the uh, entire chapter, Lord willing, throughout the message and reference it. But for right now, we're just going to start in verse number 1 and uh, read down through verse number 9. The Bible says this in Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. They said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And verse 3 is a parenthetical verse. Look at what it says, uh, kind of as a side note here. Verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam and said, Come out, ye three, into the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. The Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. But my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. 
With him, verse 8 says, will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Thank you so much for standing this morning for the reading of God's word. You may be seated, and we'll get into the message. When we think of Israel in the wilderness and the children of Israel, no doubt the prominent character that comes to mind is Moses. He was the one to whom God spoke through the burning bush. He was the one who stretched out his rod and God used to part the Red Sea. He received the stone tablets there on Sinai with the commandments from God. When we think of the leader in the wilderness, the leader of God's people, it was definitely this man, Moses. But in this chapter, we have two other characters who are prominent. It's his two siblings, Aaron and Miriam. And it's significant that they too were given leadership roles throughout the the land of Israel and in the wilderness there. Aaron was of course the first high priest and Miriam was called a prophetess. In Exodus 15 as they came across the Red Sea she sang songs of praise to God and prophecy about God. And in recording the history of Israel God describes these three similar to a, a leadership team of sorts. To guide the people through the wilderness. If you've got your notes there, I think this verse is there. Micah 6 and verse number 4, he says, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, God is saying this, and redeemed thee out of the house of thy servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. God says, I sent these three people before thee for you to watch and for you to follow. And these siblings definitely had prominent roles of leadership and example for God's people. But we also know that of the three, Moses was the one with the God-given call on his life to lead the people. He was given authority to do so by God himself. And we here we find in chapter number 12 of Numbers that authority is being challenged and criticized. As we work down through the passage, I, I call your attention this morning to what caused the criticism, what God thinks about the criticism, maybe most importantly, how did Moses handle this? Because the same issue will and has, and will again, rear its ugly head amongst God's people today. And if we don't learn how the Bible says to handle these things correctly, how do we handle a critical spirit, whether it is ours or whether it's someone else's? If we don't know how to handle it correctly, it can cause us to be moved away from following the Lord. So if you're taking notes this morning, notice the first truth that we see about the work of God. The work of God attracts a critical spirit. The work of God attracts those with a critical spirit. Now, depending on which Bible character you study, you can make a case that, yes, this should be experienced, or this should be expected. A criticism certainly falls on the work of God from those who are in opposition to it. I mean, Adam and Eve faced this way back in the Garden of Eden from Satan himself. I mean, what did the serpent say? Uh, Did God really tell you that you would die if you took that fruit right there? No, 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 no. God is hiding something from you. He's casting doubt on the word of God. He's getting them to doubt and not trust God. Nehemiah faced this when rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Sanballat and Tobias, they came against Nehemiah and they, they voiced their criticism and said, look at that wall that they're building. Even if a fox runs across the top of it, that whole wall is going to fall down. Jesus faced this himself from his opposition. The religious leaders of the day saw Jesus casting out demons and said, well, he cast out devils through the power of Beelzebub, through the power of the devil. Jesus said, well, why would I cast out devils if I'm working for the devil? And the religious leader said, "Eh, yeah, we don't know that either. The point is, whether it's Nehemiah or whether it's Jesus or, or the Old Testament characters, you find throughout the Bible 
that our adversary is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And from the earliest of God's people still to the local church today, the work of God has always faced opposition from without, especially through the form of a critical spirit. But what makes the scenario in our text a little bit different, perhaps a little more difficult, is that God's work will face criticism not just from without, but far too often from within. From those within. In this chapter, Moses joins the likes of Joseph and David and even Jesus himself again, who faced criticism from people closest to them, their own family members. And I asked the question this morning, how can something like that happen? How can this take place in a godly family? Or a godly church family. How can the work of God attract a critical spirit from those within its own ranks? Let me share with you two reasons this morning from the passage here. It does this, first of all, because our adversary is subtle. Our adversary is subtle. Let me explain what that means and we'll see it played out here in the passage. We have established that Satan will stop at nothing to hinder us from following God. He will stop at nothing to cease and to oppose and to keep the work of God from moving forward. And that also means when progress is made, when victories are experienced, we may be rejoicing and we should rejoice, but understand, he is not. That means there's a reason, church, why Valleys often come behind the mountaintops. Valleys often lie behind the mountaintops. Difficult seasons often come on a church family or on a faithful family right after they experience joys of victory and seeing God do something great. It's the seasons when people are being saved, when people are joining the church, when people are making decisions for Christ that you'll find the heaviest attack and the heaviest opposition, the most inopportune time. I'm telling us this morning, it's not a coincidence that these words were thrown against Moses because of what has just happened in chapter 11. We're not going to take the time to read all of chapter 11, but to understand this, permit me just to give us a brief summary here. In chapter 11, you'll find more criticism and more complaining falling upon Moses, but it's, a, it, it's from not his family, but it's from the people as a whole. They are tired of the manna that God provides for them, and they desire to go back to Egypt. Hey, we remember how we had it in Egypt. We had garlic, and we had cucumbers, and we had onions. You know, they don't remember that they were slaves, but they do remember we had a lot better food than what we're having now. And they complain and complain and complain. And if you know anything about these people in the Old Testament, that really is nothing new. I mean, over and over again, they complain and they gripe against God and against Moses. But Moses was just a man. As a great leader that he was, he's just a man, just like you and just like me. And after a while, these things can grow on you. In chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, Moses is so burdened and he's so overwhelmed that he cries out to God. And he says, God, I cannot take care of these people anymore. And he says this, God, if you don't help me with this, you might as well take my life. God, if I don't get some relief from this, God, if I don't get some help from this, you go ahead and kill me. That, that's coming from Moses. Can we understand, church, it takes a, a big burden to bring somebody to that point? That's where Moses is. He's in a rough spot. God, I need help. And God answers his request. He gives help. He takes care of the complaining people with quail in a rather unique way. And I'll let you read about that this afternoon. But then he also takes care of Moses. And the last part of chapter 11 is about God giving Moses more help. The Bible says that God tells Moses to select 70 elders, 70 of the leaders from the tribes and bring them out separate. And God does something special to help them. If you will, I want us to see this because it will help us understand chapter 12. Look back with me at chapter 11 and what happens at verse 25. Moses and these 70 leaders now are all come out. 
verse 25 says this, The Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, Moses, and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. They spoke about the Lord. They had his power on their lives and they did not cease. So that's what happens here. God calls these 70 people out. And the Bible says he takes the spirit from Moses and gives it to them. Or in other words, Moses, as my hand was on your life and still is, I'm going to take that hand and that spirit and that power and now I'm going to give it to these people over here so they can serve me, so you can all work together for the work of the Lord. And that's such a help to Moses that by the end of the chapter, he says, I wish it wasn't just 70 people that had that. He tells Joshua, he says, I wish that every person in the land of Israel had that kind of spirit. And we were all working together to further God's work. And by the way, we should say amen to that. We should pray and desire to have that spirit of unity and God's hand on our lives still today. But That's what has just transpired in chapter 11. Progress has been made. Moses has seen God take care of the complaining people. He's seen help when he didn't think he could go another day. He has seen the provision of God for his, his own eyes. And that's when the criticism comes. I, I say again, church, be thankful for those mountaintop experiences. Rejoice in the victories God gives you. But do not expect to stay there long without opposition. Because our adversary is subtle. He knows just when to say and just what to do and just when to do it. Our adversary is subtle, but not just because of our adversary. Criticism arises because of our flesh as well. Notice the second reason why the work of God attracts critical spirits. It's because our flesh is carnal. Our flesh is carnal. There are two attacks against Moses in the first two verses. The Bible says the first attack comes against his wife because of her nationality. And by the way, we've got some preacher's wives in here. We've got some preachers that are watching this morning. I think they will all tell you that there's no greater attack, no greater way to hurt a preacher than to say something about his wife. My wife's in kids' class this morning, but I'll go ahead and say amen to that for her, okay? The first attack is against his wife, and it's because of her nationality. And the Bible says in verse number 1 that they spoke against Moses for or because he had married an Ethiopian woman. And that just tells us the land of her origin. It was the land referred to as Cush, C-U-S-H, somewhere east of the Red Sea. But more importantly, the word means this, blackness. Blackness. So there is much evidence in the scriptures that point to this woman having a different complexion and a different skin color than Moses. Much evidence points to Moses being involved in a mixed, what we call a mixed marriage. And that was the basis for this criticism. Can I just stop and say here, because we have all kinds of people who are watching this morning, this is not a message on race, but I do want to make something very clear from what the scriptures tell us. There is nothing there is nothing in this Bible that condemns a marriage between two people because of their skin color. There's nothing in the scriptures. There's nothing in this Bible that condemns a marriage between people of two different nationalities. Now in the Old Testament, God did tell his people not to marry with the Canaanites when they went into the promised land. But that had nothing to do with how they looked. It was always, it was always due to the religion and the false gods that they served. He says, not the skin color you got to be worried about. It's their religion. Their, that false gods will turn your heart away from me. And that's the same principle in the New Testament as well. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It has nothing to do with how a person looks or the skin color. God has always been concerned about the heart and the, the heart that will worship God. And so when God told, or, or it's interesting here, I should say, that, that the criticism is about this woman and how she looks, really nothing that she has any control over, I might add. 
but the really the problem was not about his wife. That they just said that to be hurtful. It's just a cover up and a springboard to something else. And I want to try to help us real quickly if I can, church. Can I encourage you? Use discernment. Use discernment when you are around someone who is openly critical of one of God's servants. That's not to say that God's men are above criticism or we're above reproach because we're not. There is a proper time and a proper place and a proper spirit to approach those things. We do all have our weaknesses and so did Moses. I find in Exodus chapter 18 that Moses received help from a criticism from his father-in-law Jethro because it was approached with the right spirit. If you remember, his father-in-law came to him and he said, Moses, I'm seeing something here that's kind of a weakness. You're, you're trying to do all this by yourself. You're trying to judge and lead the people by yourself. And I'm just this is what I'm picking up here. If you allow this to happen, if you don't get some help, Moses, you are going to drive yourself to the ground. That's the right spirit. This is just a weakness that, I, that I'm seeing. And, and you do with it what you want to, but this can be a help to you. Moses was humble enough to listen. That's totally different than what's taking place right here. That's not to say that you can never approach me or you can never talk to me or, Pastor, why do you do this? There is a difference between criticizing and appealing with the right spirit. But I also tell us, church, be careful and use discernment. Because I found if the criticism voiced is over a minor thing that should not even be a thing, Oftentimes, it is voiced to cover up another problem that is refusing to be dealt with. A lot of times, it's covering up something else that's not being dealt with. Can you give us an example of that? What is this talking about? Just a fake example. But be careful if there's ever somebody that says, hey, did you hear about Pastor Mitchell? Be careful about Pastor Mitchell. Just thinks he's better than everybody else. I called him this week and he did not answer my call. He doesn't have time for me and just up there and and just thinks he's better than everybody else. Well, did did you call? Did you leave him a message? Well, no, if he's not going to have time for me to answer my call, then I'm not going to have time for him to leave him a message. Fake example. That's never happened. What I'm saying, should that even be a thing? No. Use discernment, church. Be wise in that area because even the best of people, People in leadership positions even can get in the flesh and say things from a carnal spirit. So if the wife is not the issue, then what is the real issue? It's the second attack that's given in verse number two. The attack attempted to put Moses in the light of obsessive pride. Who does Moses think he is? Moses gets to go around acting like he's the one, the only one through whom God speaks. That Moses thinks he's a goody two-shoe. Moses thinks he's better than everybody else. Hey, what about us as well? Now remember, this is just after the Bible says God took the spirit that was on Moses, not Miriam, not Aaron. Moses took the power and the spirit that was on him and gave it to other people. That's just what has happened. And now all of a sudden, you've got the other part of the leadership team over here kind of on the side saying, hey, hey, don't forget about us. Hey, does Moses think he's got all the power? Does Moses think God's the only, or he's the only one that God's going to use? Oh, no, God's blessing us too, and we've got power. And hey, hey, don't forget about us. And the flesh can be pretty petty, can't it? Jealousy and pride can rise up in a short amount of time. How come he gets to rule like a dictator? That's not Moses' agenda. Moses is just doing what God told him to do. God was the one who gave the 70 power. God was the one who worked in their lives, not Moses. And maybe that's why we have verse number 3 tucked in between this passage. That parenthetical verse kind of taking a pause and a time out just to remind us Moses was not proud in this situation. Moses was not ruling like a dictator. No, the Bible says he was more humble and meeker than any man on the face of the earth. That shows, church, if a humble man like Moses is just following God and seeing God work in his life, good things are happening and these kinds of accusations and criticisms come on him, then guess what? 
as you seek to follow God, as you seek to do what he tells you to do, there's a good chance you will fall under the same. The more God's work progresses and moves forward, the more it will attract a critical spirit. Our adversary sure is subtle, but our flesh, it's carnal too. We can be petty. That means, church, we got to know how to handle this. If these things come against us, what do we do? Or God help us if I'm in that position and I'm the Miriam and I'm the Aaron, what do I do? We've seen the work of God. Notice the second truth this morning. We see how the wisdom of God handles the critical spirit. The wisdom of God handles a critical spirit. We need God's wisdom. Has Moses been hurt by his brother and sister? What? Wouldn't you be? I sure would be. And if I, There might be somebody that's saying, you know what, if I was Moses, I'd just give him a piece of my mind. I'd remind them of the burning bush and the rod, and I'd tell them that I'm the leader, and you get behind me, and I'd set them straight. Well, you, you could, Moses, but that probably wouldn't be the wisest way. Just shove more authority down their throat if they're criticizing you about authority. That's, that's probably not the wisest thing to handle that. But no, the Bible says Moses was incredibly weak. Incredibly meek, not weak, meek. A week ago on Wednesday, we had a, an entire Bible study about that. But in case you weren't able to be there, notice I put this definition there in your notes. What is biblical meekness? It's not weakness. No, it is strength. It is a submissive spirit towards God that reveals itself in consideration of others. A submissive spirit towards God that reveals itself in how we act towards others. In other words, meekness says, God, I am going to place myself under your authority. God, you are in control of my life. I serve you. And because, God, I serve you, that will dictate how I respond. God, I'm going to let you respond to this, and I'm not. That's meekness, according to this Bible. That's strength that only comes from God working in your life. And that's what Moses displays for us in his response. Real quickly this morning, just want to share with us four ways that the wisdom of God is needed and why and how, how the wisdom of God handles the critical spirit. Four ways. First of all, be assured of this. Godly wisdom is assured that God hears. God hears. And aren't you glad, church, that you can trust God to handle things for you because God hears the same critics that you do. God hears and God sees. And that's exactly what we found at the end of verse number two. They're saying these things. It's a simple phrase, but it's very powerful. And the Lord heard it. He knows what was said about Moses. And notice that Moses never says a word in his own defense. That's incredible to me. He is going to talk here in just a minute, and we're going to see how incredible that is and what he does. But he never defends himself. Instead, God is the one who does all the talking. And in verse number 4, we read that God called the three to the door of the tabernacle, and the pillar of cloud descended upon it. And I remind us that the cloud represented the presence of God. That's what he led the people with by day, and the pillar of fire by night. And in this day, in the Old Testament, the door or the gates of a city, that is where the judge would sit. That's where the judge would give ruling. And so watch what God is doing here. He calls the three out to the door of the tabernacle, the place where his presence is residing. And God says, I'm going to be the judge, and I'm going to be the jury presiding over the defense of my servant. Can you rest assured, church, when God's the judge and God's the jury, justice will get served in one way or another. The right thing, I should say, will be done. And defend Moses is exactly what God does. You can rest assured that God hears. You can also rest assured, number two, that God answers. God answers. The basis of the complaint from Miriam and Aaron was essentially this. 
What is so special about Moses? Who does he think he is? And in verses 6 through 8, God explains what was so special about him. God tells them Moses is not a normal prophet. Which if he was, that would be special in and of itself. The prophets received, in this day, they did not have the the completed Bible like you and I have today to hear from God. They received dreams and they received visions from God. That's what a prophet or a prophetess like Miriam would have received. But God, in essence, is telling Miriam, Moses is special because he's not like you. He says, Moses gets to speak with me mouth to mouth or face to face. Not literal here because no one has seen the face of God, but it's uh, referring to the level of intimacy between the two. A closeness. And he he says, Moses has seen the similitude of me. There was a time where I placed Moses in the cleft of the rock and I passed before him and he saw my backside, if you will. And, And the Bible says that Moses was so close to God that his face radiated and it showed and it glowed from the glory of God. That was Moses. That didn't happen to Miriam. Didn't happen to the other prophets. See, both things are emphasizing the same truth. Moses has this power and Moses has this authority because he is closer to me. Because Moses is my servant. That's not the words of Moses, church. That's the words of God. Powerful words, aren't they? Powerful words. God hears, God answers. We can also be assured of this. Thirdly, we can be assured that God rewards. God rewards Would you look at the Bible with me again at verse number 9 and 10? You know, Miriam and Aaron don't speak anything in defense, and truthfully, there's nothing they can say. Verse 9 says this, The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. Twice, twice in those two verses, the Bible puts an emphasis on God departing and the presence of God departing that area And notice what happens right after that. Behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. She received leprosy. I remind us, church, that nothing good comes when the presence of God departs. Nothing good. One writer put it this way, The removal of God's presence from us is the surest and saddest token of God's displeasure against us. It's very true. And after God ends the court session, the verdict and the chastisement is carried out as Miriam becomes white with leprosy. Now there might be some who read that and say, well, why her and not Aaron? I mean, it doesn't say that Aaron was a leper, but they were both talking. That's what verse 1 says. Well, notice back in verse 1 that she is listed first. Miriam and Aaron. She's the one who receives the judgment. And the way the, way, uh, the, 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 the sentence structure is uh, organized there, the word spake in verse number 1. Miriam and Aaron spake. The word spake is in reference to Miriam. It's what we call a, a feminine word. In other words, she is the one where this has originated. And Aaron went along with it. That's what you find Aaron doing a lot. He was not necessarily the strongest of leaders. Aaron, we haven't found Moses for 40 days. How about you make us a golden calf? Well, okay, we'll go ahead and do it. That's what he did before, and now he's doing it again. Can you believe that, Moses? Who does he think he is? Well, yeah, I guess you're right. That was Aaron. But the Bible is indicating that it stemmed from Miriam. Well, leprosy doesn't seem like much of a reward. Well, not a good one. You're right. But friend, can I remind us that God does hear. And there is a law of sowing and reaping in the Bible. She wanted to be recognized for God's hand on her and spoke poorly because of it. I can say it this way, it was easy to see his hand on her now, wasn't it? I'm saying we'd be wise to submit ourselves to God and let him take care of things in his timing. And in his way, because he is plenty capable of defending and answering and rewarding. 
a godly response to criticism is a response left to God. Let me say that again. A godly response to criticism is a response left to God. Say, that's not easy, Pastor. No, it is not. But I also remind us that the chapter is not over yet. Because there's one more aspect of wisdom that is necessary for us to glean and remember and apply when we are criticized. Godly wisdom is assured, yes, that God hears. And yes, that He can answer as He sees fit. And yes, that He rewards in His timing. But this might be the most important. Be assured that God heals. Be assured that God heals. Pastor Mitchell, I, I know what you're saying about not responding. Okay, well, what are we left to do? What are we supposed to do then? If I'm not supposed to say anything, if I'm not supposed to lash back out, I mean, in, in this case, I mean, God was right there in a matter of minutes, but, but I haven't seen a pillar of cloud in my, in, in my life uh, in recent days with this critic. What if I'm like David in the Psalms and I don't see God answer and I don't see Him reward right away? Am I just supposed to do nothing? Did Moses do anything? Well, yes, he did. And there's something for us to do when we fall under criticism and we wait for God to do as he sees fit. And here it is. We pray. Uh, I knew it. A spiritual answer. Spiritual cliche. No, no, no. It's more than that. This is the difference maker, church. This is the difference maker in handling criticism correctly and being unmovable by criticism, it's your prayer life. See, as much as has been said about Moses, as much as has been said to Moses, I find it significant that the only time, the only time you find Moses opening his mouth and speaking in this chapter, it is not in retribution. It's not in anger. It's not in malice. It is in verse number 13. Look with me what the Bible says. Verse number 13. Moses cried unto the Lord saying, strike her now. No, wait, wait. That's not what it says, is it? Sorry, sorry. That's not what it says. Verse number 13. Moses cried unto... Just making sure you guys are awake. Okay, sounds like you are. Verse number 13. Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. That's the only time you see Moses speaking with this criticism. God, would you help her? He's praying for the one who has just hurt him the most. He's more concerned with her wounds than his. He's concerned with his sister. He's concerned that Miriam be brought back into the place of fellowship, back in the camp with God's people again. He is concerned about her well-being. And that's why this is so hard. Because let's be transparent here. That is not the first prayer that comes to your mouth or this mouth when we get criticized. And I'll be the first to say amen to that. That's not the first prayer that comes to our mouth. God help them. Our flesh, our first response, our first instinct is not to be concerned with their well-being. Please catch this next phrase, church. This next statement. You will only be able to pray in this fashion if you first have been a recipient of God's healing grace. You will only, only be able to pray in this fashion if you have first been a recipient of God's healing grace. I noted that Moses did not speak until the end of the chapter. You know, a lot's transpired before then, before he speaks. He's been hurt, yes. He's been criticized, but he's also been helped. God has come to his side. God has come to his defense. And because he has been helped by God, listen, he can now view the people who hurt him in the right light. Because 
he got helped. You will not be able to pray, God, help them, until you first pray, God, help me. God, help me. I need your help. I need your healing. I need your grace. Grace. You know, the people who extend the most grace are the people who recognize they have received the most grace. The best givers of grace have been the biggest recipients of grace. God, I want you to help them because I know how you have helped me. God, help me. And now that I have, and those things take time. Yes, I'm not saying that, 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 he, that the hurt will go away instantaneously. But I am saying that God's grace is sufficient to provide healing. And God can give you the grace to be concerned about the other's well-being and pray for them too. See, we need God's grace if we're to be unmoved by criticism and if the work of the Lord is to be unmoved. I think there are two most important verses in this entire chapter. To me, they're verses 15 and 16. Look at these verses. We'll wrap this up. We're almost through, I promise. Most important verses in the entire chapter. You ready? Here we go. Verse 15. Miriam was shut from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Those are important verses. Yes, they are. What is so important about the people twiddling their thumbs for seven days while Miriam gets quarantined for her leprosy? What is so important about the people picking up their tents and moving on to a new place? Because listen, that's how this chapter ends. And that's the exact same way the previous chapter ends as well. The last verse of chapter 11 is God saying, okay, now it's time to move forward. Pick up your tents and move to where I have you to be. That did not happen while this was taking place. See, the whole thing here in this chapter, it's not about, can, can we see the big picture today? The whole chapter, the whole big picture, it's not just about Moses. It's not just about Miriam. It's not just about Aaron, although they were the main players. This whole chapter is about the people of God and the work of God moving forward. And the work of God will only move forward when a critical spirit is handled correctly. The work of God in this local church will only move forward to where God wants us to be when we handle the critical spirit in the four ways that the Bible has shown us today. And the work of God in your life will only move forward past anger, past bitterness, past hurt until you handle it the way the Bible tells us to handle it today. See, God is willing to say, okay, don't go. Park it here. It takes seven days, takes seven weeks, seven months, however long it takes. We're going to get this taken care of. And then when it is taken care of. By the way, what I like about the end of the chapter, Miriam was the one with the critical spirit, but she was brought back into the camp and the people moved forward again when the person who caused the hurt was brought back into the camp. I'm saying it takes God's grace not just to heal you, but it takes God's grace to move you forward from the hurt. And it's not just with the critical spirit. That's how the local church body and we should handle any sin, whether it's a critical spirit, whether it's pride, whether it's lust. Let's deal with it. Let's get it right before the Lord. And then let's link arms together and let's move forward with what he's called us to do. Won't happen if we don't handle this correctly. Well, when it was, God said, okay, it's time to go. It's time for you to get closer to where I desire you to be. I just ask you this morning two questions and we're through. Is a critical spirit holding you back from where God wants you to be? Is it yours? 
Is it your attitude? Is it your spirit towards another believer? Would you make the wise decision today to ask God for forgiveness and grace so He can remove that today and move forward in your life? Don't let your spirit stop the work of your marriage from progressing or your children from progressing or what God is doing in this church from progressing. Take care of that today. Second question is this. Is another's critical spirit keeping you from being where God wants you to be? Maybe the spirit wasn't yours, but it was somebody else's. And you remember the words that were said. You remember the actions that were done. You remember what was said about you or about your family or about loved ones or about brothers or sisters close to you. And someone's past words, all they do is bring up anger and bring up bitterness. Can I say, friend, you will never reach the promised land, the victorious Christian life, until we handle this correctly. Can we get to a place today where we pray that prayer of grace and say, God, help me with this. I'm tired of being dragged down by this. I'm tired of dwelling on this. I'm tired of not moving forward for you. I am ready to be done with this. The only way that's going to happen, church, is if we are recipients of God's grace. An extra dose of God's grace. And that's the great thing about our God. When it comes to His grace, we drink from a never-ending supply. Let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer, church. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Those two questions again, church. Let's personalize those today. Do I have a critical spirit right now in my life? not saying it's towards me or towards another pastor. Maybe it's just towards another believer. Maybe it's towards a co-worker. Maybe it's towards somebody else in this church. I don't know what's going on in your heart, and I don't necessarily need to today. But I do know this. There was an entire generation that never reached the promised land because they never stopped complaining and got over the critical spirit towards God and towards the people he puts in front of them. Don't let that be said about you. Can we say, God, help me and give that grace to me Or others of us need to say, God, I need your healing grace today. I have dwelt on this hurt. It still comes to my mind. I'm ready to be done with it. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to be bitter anymore. I'm ready to move on with my life. Oh, God can help you with that, and he's ready to. But we first got to pray, God, help me. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm going to have a word of prayer and open up the invitation. As soon as I get done praying, the piano is going to begin to play. And as God speaks to your heart, I invite you just to step out right from where you're seated. Spend some time in prayer here at the front or spend some time in prayer there at your chair and ask God to give you that wonderful grace. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we need your grace today. We need it tomorrow. We want your work to be done and accomplished and your will to be done in our lives. That's not going to be accomplished by ourselves. We need your help. We need your grace. Bless this invitation, Lord. Use it to administer grace to your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Could we stand together this morning? The invitation is open to you. You need to come for any reason today. There's there's room here at the front to pray at these front stairs or these front chairs. You can set up a room right there where you're seated. You can just sit back down and pray right there in your chair. If you don't want to come forward, that'd be fine. But the most important thing is, God, what do you want me to do with this message? What kind of help do you need from God today? What hurt do you have that you've held on to for way too long? God can help you. Would you humble yourself and recognize, God, I need that grace today. Piano's playing. People are praying. Most important part of our service, would you respond accordingly? play through another verse there's still time to pray we still have folks praying you take as much time as you need 
this is why we come. Not just to hear, not just to grow in knowledge, but to make a decision. Okay, God, you've given me this truth. Now what do I need to do with it? Take some more time to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and how the truths that are recorded in it, the principles, are still so relevant and so helpful to us. Lord, we knew that this was going to be a difficult message to hear, but I do feel like you have helped your people today. And if it is going to continue being a help, we don't just need it today. We're going to need it tomorrow and next week and the next time that, that ugly devil wants to rear his head and try to bring up some things to our past and our memories. God, would you give us grace to move forward in what you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Church family had a wonderful time together. Praise the Lord. We had a little bit of a hiccup with our music in the front of the service, but y'all just rolled with it, and God uh, worked all that out for us to be able to have the, the rest of our music service and uh, had a great day today. We're looking forward to being back together in God's house tonight at 530. Brother Anthony is going to be preaching for us. You won't want to miss that. That'll be, look, that'll be a wonderful time. If we can do anything for you, don't hesitate to ask us on the way out the door, but trust you have a great afternoon. God bless you, church. You are dismissed. Thank you.